Hey, how's it going everybody? Rob Clark here and today I'm going to come at you with a very important topic, something that's, you know, weighing on me heavily and it has to do with recent events here in North Carolina. It has to do with the U.S. ARC. It has to do with laws and regulations. And yes, unfortunately, it has to do with Christopher Gifford. Um, so, I'm just it's going to be a long post, I think, a long video. Uh, while I'm talking, you may get an opportunity to admire this uh, Super Phantom. This is uh, one of my yearlings, solid white, what they call blue-eyed Lucy or Super Phantom Retic, female, six feet long. This is not a sales pitch. I'm not trying to sell this snake. She is definitely one that I intend to keep and is one of my favorites in this collection. Uh, a couple people have said that these tend to have uh, various health issues. I've not experienced any of that, and this is not the only Super Phantom that I own, nor is it the only Super Phantom that I've had. But <clears throat> all that aside, I'm just uh, rambling a little bit about what I'm passionate about. These are great snakes, and they should be admired, they should be protected, and by protected, I mean protected by us. The hobbyists, the breeders, the industry, whatever you want to call it, not protected by people who have no idea how these animals live or what it takes to take care of them. They shouldn't be protected, managed, regulated by people in a suit. Let's just put it that way. And so in North Carolina, Things have gotten kind of nasty and sketchy lately, and it's got me concerned. It's got a lot of people here in this state concerned, and it's a, an issue that really could affect a lot of reptile keepers across the entire country. So, I don't care if you are in South Carolina, Virginia, neighboring states like Tennessee or Georgia, or if you're all the way up in Maine, or all the way across the country in California, Washington, Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and I know you guys have already got some issues down in Florida, and U.S. ARC is working to resolve that, but, uh, you know, the, what's going on in North Carolina could affect you in Florida, too. It, it really could, and U.S. ARC, you guys, you guys got your hands full. So, to kind of lay it out, as you're probably aware, uh, this week, last week, recently, whatever, it was discovered that there was a zebra, cobra loose in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Raleigh is the state capital. It's a very affluent city. It's got a lot of HOA, gated communities. There's a lot of politicians there, doctors, lawyers you know, financial, banker, business-oriented type people, and they're not a part of the reptile community by any stretch of the imagination. And this young man, 21 years old, Christopher Gifford, who many of us had never heard of until recently, um, despite the fact that he had a rather large TikTok following, uh, he ended up, well, it was discovered that there was this zebra cobra loose in his neighborhood. And it was later discovered that he had been the owner of that animal. And it had been missing, supposedly, admittedly, since November. Yeah. And he hadn't reported it missing as required by state law. So... A search went underway. They did find and locate this animal. Not only is it an African cobra, it is a spitting cobra. But nobody was ever injured. Nobody was ever hurt. Nobody was bitten. The animal never had an opportunity or an occasion to spit venom at anybody. And in this situation, I would argue that this is a win. Check it in the win column. Um, it should be a win. Nobody got injured. The laws somewhat worked, but obviously the laws were broken. When laws are broken, laws can't work if, if the laws aren't followed. And that's what 
leads me to this video. This is where I'm really concerned. If it had just been Christopher Gifford, you know, making the news, ah, okay, he was immature, he was young, he was inexperienced, yes, he even got bitten a few months ago by a green mamba, hadn't learned his lesson, his animals supposedly weren't properly secured, um, don't know what led to the release or escape of the cobra, but he did admit to the authorities that that animal had been loose since November. And honestly, that amazes me. Um, Raleigh is not a warm climate place. Raleigh is a little bit further north from me. It's about two hours north which doesn't sound like much, but when you talk about where that line is on the map for snowstorms and ice and uh, freezing rain, things of that nature, it's usually going to be up in the Raleigh area closer to the Virginia line. We did have a mild winter, and I suppose the snake could have survived winter by dwelling in a crawl space or an attic, but it also amazes me that it stayed in the same neighborhood, that it hadn't traveled at least a couple of miles from right there. But this snake was supposedly located just like on the next street over and around the corner uh, from his residence. But obviously mistakes were made on his part, and he did break the law. So for those of you who may or may not know, and if you're in North Carolina, it is North Carolina General Statute 14 dash 417, that is the statute that pertains to venomous snakes uh, and keeping them, housing them, locking them up, etc., etc., labeling. And it is General Statute 14 417.1 that pertains to large, I say large, constrictors. And large constrictors are defined and included our reticulated pythons. So I researched this heavily um, last year just making sure that I was complying with the law. I talked to animal control personnel and made sure that everything was being done so that I myself would not face any criminal charges or violations. I do have everything properly labeled. I have permanent enclosures locked. I have uh, an escape plan, what to do if there's an animal that is escaped or discovered missing. The labeling includes scientific and common names, and if there's more than one animal in an enclosure, then it is marked with the number of animals that are supposedly in that enclosure. Uh, these are all things that the law requires in North Carolina. Each state is different. but. Again, the law was broken per pertaining to Chris Gifford. Um, he's facing about 40 misdemeanor charges, and rightfully so, he broke the law. Um, some of that might be disputable in the court of law. Maybe if it goes to trial, it may he may be acquitted, he may be exonerated, uh, found not guilty, whatever. And at the same time, he may plead out to two or three reduced charges. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. But again, that's not really affecting me. Here's the part that affects me. Here's the part that affects every other reptile keeper in North Carolina. Here's the part that may affect you in other states. There is a couple of legislators in this state, one quoted in the news, representative and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, Chaudhuri, C-H-A-U-D-H-U-R-I. Um, this person has said that it's a wonder nobody got killed by the venom spitting or venom being spit. Obviously, you know, that statement shows that this person has a lack of understanding of spitting cobras like for those of you who aren't familiar with venomous reptiles particularly spitting cobras the act of spitting venom is not intended to kill anybody and it's not a fatal attack they do that to cause 
temporary blindness, let me say it a little louder for the ones in the back, temporary blindness. And this is to allow the person or animal that may be threatening this animal to escape. It is a defense tactic. It is a means of buying them some time so that they can take off, leave the area, flee their attacker. Cobras in particular, yes, some can be aggressive, but a spinning cobra in particular is more of a defensive animal that wants to flee and get away, so it spits the venom to bite it some time so that once its attacker is temporarily blinded, it can then escape. That is pretty much the way that almost all spinning cobras operate. Now. The concern is that this child hurry person, C-H-A-U-D-H-U-R-I, this person is wanting to introduce new legislation, new laws, thinks the laws need to be stronger. In particular, he is suggesting that people be required to register their venomous animals. I'm not entirely opposed to that. If if it stops there but my concern is will it go any further are they going to start wanting people to register their ball pythons are they going to start wanting people to register their king snakes are they going to start wanting people to register other animals that are not indigenous to north carolina such as chinchillas you know where does it stop and it we need to draw a line we need to draw a line and we need to say no, we need to collectively say that there are already laws on the books. We don't need more laws on the books. If Christopher Gifford or some other person breaks the law and violates the law and should be charged, then charge that person. When the law is broken, that doesn't mean that we should go to the legislators and automatically start writing new laws. If that's the game we want to play, then every time somebody speeds down the road or doesn't wear their seatbelt or doesn't renew their tag, then are we going to punish everybody? Are we going to start writing new laws because John Doe was speeding this morning on his way to work? No, that's not how this works. You write new laws when you don't already have laws to cover the situation. And in this case, there were already laws to cover the situation. And what this chod hurry person doesn't understand is what a strong state North Carolina is for the reptile community, for the reptile industry. One of, or some of, however you want to look at it, some of the biggest reptile breeders in the country are in North Carolina. And if you look at North Carolina collectively, we're probably in the top five states for reptile breeding or reptile producing top five states in the country. There are some big names here. There are some big programs here. And there's also some big companies here that don't necessarily produce a lot of reptiles, but maybe are involved with sales concerning uh, thermostats and husbandry items, enclosures, um, heat tape, snake cooks, and a variety of other things that we use on a daily basis. You hurt those industries when you start hurting the reptile community and putting the red tape out there. And I've made this argument before. Let me make it again. I'm a fan of all animals. I love if it's got fur, if it's got scales, I don't care. You know, my cat's in here annoying me. Um, I've, I've got a dog. I mean, I love all animals. So I'm not picking on pit bull owners. Don't, don't get me wrong. Pit bull, you got a pit bull, you love your pit bull, great. I'm, I'm happy for you. Uh, when I see it, I'll pet it. <sighs> but, but pit bulls have a bad reputation. Yes, there have been incidents in the news where pit bulls have killed people, maimed children, killed other pets. Are we requiring everybody to register their pit bull? I mean, should if we're, if we're going to play that game, if you're going to require people to register their snakes, venomous or not, whatever, then shouldn't we also require people to register their dogs? And it's not just pit bulls. I mean, dogs in general, they can do damage. They can go in the neighbor's yard and dig a hole. 
oh, well, that dog should be registered with the state, right? I mean, this snake, even though there was a lot of hysteria, there was a lot of panic, it hurt no one. You can say it had the potential to hurt somebody all you want to, but guess what? So does a dog. Cats are harmful to the environment. Are we going to start causing all cat owners to register their cat? You know, I get the point, I get the intent, I get the logic. But it's a flawed logic. I'm sorry if you're a lawmaker in the state and you disagree with me. I'm a voter, okay? I'm a registered voter. I've got my say and this is my say. You can't go creating new laws based on hysteria. Inform yourselves. Get the facts and then be fair to your taxpayers and your voters. I understand that there are a lot of concerned people in Raleigh that think that, oh, there should be new laws, there should be new regulations. And I'm sitting here telling you, no, there shouldn't. If you're going to do that, if you're going to play that game, be fair to all taxpayers, be fair to all voters, and write a law that addresses all animals. It's as simple as that. We've got dogs that can be harmful, and there's been a lot more people hurt by dogs, a lot more people killed by dogs than all the venomous snakes. It's statistics, it's facts, look it up, you know, I'm sorry. But for those of you who don't believe me, that don't understand the situation is dire, look it up in the news, Google it. I personally know a lot of politicians at different levels, mayors, sheriffs, elected sheriffs, not just deputies, uh, district attorneys, uh, legislators and just about all levels of state local county government I know a lot of people and the one thing I can say that speaks volumes and speaks to them is votes one thing they all have in common is they want to get reelected one thing they all do is they listen to their constituents unfortunately they don't always listen to the facts I know there's a few people out there uh, that want to say, oh, you know, teach the science, push the science, push the facts, push the information. But if 51% of the population goes with what hysteria says, instead of the facts, the politicians are going to go with hysteria. I'm sorry, that's just how it is. They're politicians. They want to get reelected. Votes are what reelect them not facts, not information. We can all think of at least one instance in the recent two, three, four, five years where there was misinformation in the news that pushed a political agenda and it went that way because people believe everything they see and hear and read in the media. So really right now I know that U.S. ARC mainly gets involved with things after there's a law written, but on occasion they do lobby, they do talk to politicians, they do try to influence certain laws to be written or not written or how they're going to be written if it's unavoidable. And right now, Phil Goss, where are you at? We need you. We need some help. Send somebody have them get in touch with this Chad Hurry person and start pushing the US ARC agenda. We need it here right now more than ever because right now what we're dealing with in terms of snowball versus avalanche is a snowball. But as we all know, once a snowball gets going downhill and collects more and more snow and builds momentum, by the time this thing is said and done, we could be facing a Florida type situation where there's mass legislation because of mass hysteria. The lawmaker Chad Hurry guy may go to the General Assembly one day and say, I'm introducing this bill to tighten regulations on venomous reptiles. And another legislator may speak up and say, Hey, let's add pythons to the mix. Let's 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 make things tougher for those people. And then somebody else might say, oh, okay, well, 
I heard a chinchilla bit a little girl's finger. Those are dangerous. Let's let's add those. And then the next thing you know, there's an entire list of, ooh, oh no, dangerous animals that they've got listed and regulated and have to be registered or they're flat out illegal. And I mean, I'm sorry, but I have a lot of snakes. I have a lot of pythons. I'm obeying the law, but if they come down and say, I have to register every single animal, how's that going to work when, you know, if you think about it, two, three, four clutches of eggs hatch all at once, and you're banging out a couple hundred baby retics a year, am I going to have to register every single baby because it's here for two or three months or four months before it sells? You know, it's going to get insane. And this is the type of stuff that should freak all of you out. This is the kind of stuff that should have all of us worried. Whether you're a pit bull owner, a cat owner, a chinchilla owner, or you're into the good stuff. We got to take action right now. We got to stick together. We need to draw the line. And right now, North Carolina is becoming a battleground. So... I'm encouraging everybody to support U.S. ARC. I'm encouraging everybody to contact Phil Goss and U.S. ARC and send them here, get things going. Don't wait until it's too late. Let's stop the legislation before it's even entered. And let's contact Chaud Hurry again. C-H-A-U-D-H-U-R-I. This person obviously has no idea what he's talking about. But because he's gotten 10 or 15 emails or phone calls from a few concerned citizens, oh, it's time to, you know, break bad and crack a whip and regulate, regulate, regulate. And I'm sorry. I I'll stick to what I said. The laws work if they're followed. If this Christopher Gifford guy broke the law, you don't fix that by writing more laws. If you're going to do that, then you need to write new laws every time somebody speeds or doesn't wear their seatbelt. You only write new laws to address things that aren't already regulated, okay? At, at best, if you want to change the class misdemeanor, then make it tough or increase the penalty for it. But really, do you do that because of one person? Or shouldn't you do that when there's been a rash of violations and a rash of uh, crimes committed then it's time to make things a little more serious. So right now, let's, let's take a step back. Let's chill. Let's relax. Let's not go throwing the you know legislation around freely, haphazardly, without all the facts. Let's take a break. Let's, let's breathe for a second. And the last thing I want to hear from anybody is don't say that people shouldn't own venomous snakes. Don't say that people shouldn't own cobras. I don't own a cobra right now. I don't know that I ever will, but I may. I want to keep my options open, but folks, let's face the facts. It's very different for somebody to own a dangerous, venomous animal in an apartment complex versus a mobile home park versus a gated community versus a single resident home in the country where the nearest neighbor is hundreds of yards away. If you make a law and you're doing that with apartment complexes in mind, you're punishing somebody who lives out in the country. There's no reason why somebody out in the country shouldn't be able to own a Cobra as long as they're doing it responsibly. And I know I'm posting this on my page um, you know, it's probably going to get seen by my subscribers on YouTube. So most of you won't really have much concern, you know, like you'll, you'll tend to agree with me. The ones I really want to speak to, the ones I really wish I could reach, are the people who are not involved in the animal community. I wish I could go talk to this Chaud Hurry person myself, and I probably will send an email respectfully explaining the situation and... and I probably will fall on deaf ears, but 
I just wish people could understand that these animals aren't that dangerous. These animals are relatively safe. They're not vicious creatures. They're not out to kill anybody. Um, you know, I understand there are certain dangers involved with cobras and mamas and things like that, but there are also precautions and there are safety measures that can be taken. And the fact is that this Christopher Gifford person was obviously very immature, very irresponsible. And yeah, that was him. Don't punish everybody. Don't punish everybody else. Punish the person who broke the law. When the law gets broken, you don't go punishing everybody. You punish the criminal. You know, this is very basic stuff. It's a very basic principle. If I ever run for politics, I think that would be my platform. Um, so anyway, I think this post is over and done. I hope everybody understands the perspective. I hope that you take action. I hope that you support U.S. ARC. I hope that you help draw this line in the sand. I hope that you will contact this Chad Hurry person and express your feelings about this situation in a positive and supportive way. Don't threaten him. Don't be belligerent. You know, try to sound educated even if you're not. And let's let's hit this together with one voice let's encourage us arc to send a representative here to contact chad chad hurry or maybe they can contact chad hurry through email or written communication some way shape or form to let him know that you know we have a voice we have um representation and that if there's going to be a fight uh, if, if he's going to do this, if he's going to try to introduce or pass legislation, he won't do it without a fight. Because this is serious stuff, guys. Whether you believe me or not, this is serious stuff. This could change the industry here in North Carolina, and it could have an impact throughout the nation. So I think that's really all I've got to say on the matter. Um, I hope things work out for everybody. And if you ever need anything from me, if you've got any questions concerning the laws here in North Carolina, I've researched it thoroughly. I'm in compliance. I'll be glad to help you get in compliance. I'll be glad to educate you a little bit. Uh, give you an example, things like hatchling racks. Um, the law says that permanent enclosures have to have locks. Well, there's a lot of questions, legal questions concerning that. Uh, what constitutes a lock or what if the structure is made so that it isn't able to be opened for example I use a, a screw with a power tool and literally screw some of these other enclosures I've gotten from other people not stuff that I built I, I screw them shut uh, I drilled a hole through the plexiglass and the snake can't open it a burglar can't open it you'd have to have a power tool to open it so it's effectively locked but a hatchling rack is that considered a permanent enclosure um, I say no the animal control people that I've consulted say no and they say that you know you have to look at and examine the purpose of the law and for it to have a lock I think they're talking about safety and a baby doesn't pose a threat to anybody a baby retic um, that baby gets out it's not going to survive winter it's not going to populate the area it's minimal risk to anybody so a hatchling rack you know doesn't need to be locked but in your county in your area in your city somebody might tell you differently and that may be an issue for a judge or a jury to decide but the law says permanent enclosure. My argument is a hatchling rack is not a permanent enclosure. That baby will not reside in that permanently. So that's the basis for that. Uh, at any rate, I'm Rob Clark, Rob Clark Pythons. Feel free to hit me up and as always, expect big things.